A huge gratitude to all of the understudies across all of the stages in New York. My understudy Tim Wright is here as well. Our stage crew, our swings. Mallory Medke, dance captain in the alternate, who was put into this number 12 hours ago. It's what they do, because the show must go on, and this one will. The old saying of the show must go on has been a staple in show business for ages. The phrase has developed a rather controversial connotation in the last little while especially in the midst of a still raging pandemic where circumstances have put performers, crew, and audiences at risk. Wherever you sit on the subject, theater producers have come to be more and more dependent on covers and understudies in ensuring that the show does indeed go on, sometimes as a matter of keeping the show alive. Understudies, swings, and standbys around the world are having something of a moment right now in being recognized for their work in the theater, but pandemic or not, they have always played a vital role, whether the audience knows it or not. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about understudies. And to help me out, I'll be speaking with covers and understudies from Broadway, Canada, and London's West End to learn just what goes into making sure the show does go on. Before we get started, if you're new here and want to see more of this content, make sure to like this video and hit that subscribe button. Your future's in it. My future and everything all of us have is staked on you. All right, now I'm through. But you keep your feet on the ground and your head on those shoulders of yours and go out and saw you. You're going out a youngster, but you've got to come back a star. For those who are not necessarily from the theater world, there may be a tendency to subscribe to the myths that surround being an understudy, an ambitious, hungry, star to be dutifully waiting in the wings, in some cases, scheming from the wings, for their big chance in a doggy dog world. While I wouldn't say these people do not exist in the theater, they're also a wildly dramatized depiction of backstage life, albeit a very entertaining one. Nice speech, Eve. But I wouldn't worry too much about your heart. You can always put that award where your heart ought to be. There's also the trope of the understudy, stepping out and becoming a star. For this, there is precedent to go by. Take, for instance, people like Shirley MacLaine and Sutton Foster, who once understudies themselves, both in their own turns happened upon performance opportunities that changed the course of their careers. While the lore of these stories is undeniably irresistible, it's not really the thing that keeps the show going on. In researching for this video, I was practically tripping over the mentions of understudies being called the unsung players of the theater. Given how often this phrase has been sung, I'd revise that idea to understudies being the misunderstood players of the theater, some of whom I've had the fortune of speaking with these past few weeks. To start our conversations, I asked them all the same question. What makes a good understudy? I think somebody who's very organized and has a cool head, like everybody has nerves, but you can't, you, you have to be somebody who's gonna be able to like breathe and look around you. And I think not not be a perfectionist. Most of what we do is, is like high pressure, high intensity, getting thrown on mid show or late notice. Um, and you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with the pressure. And I think you have to also know how to appear calm and, and, and cool on the surface, no matter what's happening underneath. I think you really need to be somebody who sees all aspects of a show, who really doesn't live just in their character. Um, and I think there are some actors that kind of, it's blinders on, this is my track, this is what I do. But I think to be a good standby or understudy, you really need to have your eyes open to every single moving part in the same way like a director would um, or a choreographer. Like you just, you see things and you can take them in. You have to be organized um, and you have to know what your process is going to be for it because everybody kind of does it differently as far as I've seen. And I think uh, you need to be patient with yourself as well. That's a big thing. Don't beat yourself up too much because it's an easy thing to do. It's not easy. It's so hard. Uh, you have to know that and, and be okay with putting in the work, especially at the beginning of a contract. You want to just make sure that you're keeping everybody safe around you because there are a number of times you have to run and do choreography where you could really injure yourself or somebody else. Like you need to be have enough of a cool head about you to be focused on that and not so stressed about the perfect performance. It's a bit of a weird dichotomy. 
having to be incredibly specific with details, knowing your mark and lines, while at the same time being able to let it all go. It's a type of person. And of course, in the theater, there are different types of understudies, which we'll go through here. Before that, my guests will be using a few words throughout the episode that some here may not be familiar with. The first being tracks. Tracks is basically another word for the role of an actor. In simplest terms, the track refers to an actor's blocking, choreography, and overall trajectory in the show. A role or track is assigned to a cover, which is the understudy. Now back to talking about the different kinds of understudies, let's talk about the swing, who is often required to learn multiple tracks in a show. Like Tommy Wade Smith, who is currently appearing in the West End production of Moulin Rouge. Now, there are different kinds of swings that are specific to particular shows and productions, but in most cases, a swing shows up to the theater every day and only goes on if someone is ill, injured, or on a scheduled vacation. To say that a swing is not working if they are not on stage is only the beginning of misunderstanding what their job is. I mean, it takes a type of person to be a swing, but there are things that everyone can do to be a good swing. I like to be present and alert, and I just take in all information, whether I think it applies to me, especially at the beginning of a contract in like a rehearsal period. Um, whenever they're talking to, even if it's like the principals or like the female ensemble or whatever, I like to take in as much information. So I cover nine tracks in Moulin Rouge. So they're all ensemble tracks. Six of them, I would say, are like heavy dance tracks. Two of them are singer-mover tracks. So there's less choreography, more emphasis on the vocals. And then one of them is kind of a hybrid um, in between, but, but nine in total. As swings, I don't know if it's the same on all shows, but if it's the same on Broadway and the West End, all sh uh, shows I've swung on, you have um, like priorities. So there are nine tracks, like I said. So I have three first covers, three second covers, and three third covers. So in the first instance, if any of my three first covers go off, I'm the go-to guy. The go-to guy for one of the other first covers can't go on, then I'm the go-to guy for the second or whatever. It's, it's like a pecking order. That's a lot of information to take in. And for a fast-paced show like Moulin Rouge with challenging choreography and many complex moving parts, I personally would find it hard trying to wrap my head around learning just one track. So I asked Tommy what his particular process was in learning his nine tracks in the show. So I kind of compartmentalize. I, first of all, uh, learn or try and learn and take in all the choreography and the steps and the movement and the partner work. And then there's the spacing, the traffic, the costume changes, the more sort of logistical things. So I think if you can try and um, get a grips or get to grips and get hold of, of, of that one section of like movement and choreography, I then try and not think about that. And then I can focus on the harder part in my opinion, which is making sure you're going in the right gaps and in the right places at the right time, making the right entrances, the right exits. So I just absorb as much as I can. Um, because, yeah, you can never know too much about the show. If, if you know the whole show back to front, you're sorted. I like it when people say, I didn't even know you were on. Part of me doesn't like it because I'm like, oh, I feel like not seen or whatever. But if, if you can go on as a swing and just fly under the radar and just make it feel like it feels every night for the ensemble to do it every night, that's like tick. That's, that's my main goal. The way it typically has happened is that once a show has opened, the cast will then begin understudy rehearsals, where covers will then have the opportunity to be properly taught their respective tracks, usually by a stage manager, dance captain, or associate director. But this is live theater and anything can happen, and it's not uncommon for a swing to go on for a track that they have only ever watched rather than rehearsing with other people something that Broadway's Julie Benko is only too familiar with, having been a swing for multiple tracks in the Broadway revival of Fiddler on the Roof. I've covered, you know, eight people. Sometimes you get rehearsal, but oftentimes you don't. And so your job is to write it all down or videotape the rehearsal, go home, put it together in a way that, in a system that works for you, rehearse on your own and be ready to go at the drop of a hat. Getting the opportunity to be trusted to learn so many parts is sometimes earned through past experiences. In Julie's case, she had the chance to understudy early on when she was cast in the ensemble of the first national tour of Spring Awakening. Yes, that was my first job. 
and I covered five, I covered all the girls. Yeah. So, you know, Vendla, Ilsa, Anna, Marta, Taya. And I went on for everybody except Anna. She was very healthy. Um, <laughs> it was a big job for a 19 year old. Being in the ensemble of that show, we were in the onstage bleachers. So I watched that show so many times. And the best thing you can do as an understudy is watch, you know, it was my job to watch the show. So I really would just, you know, pick each day. I'd be like, today I'll watch Vendla, today I'll watch Taya, today I'll watch Ilsa. And you just, because there are so many little things where obviously when the lights are up and that person is in their special moment, that's the easier part to learn. It's all the stuff that's like, and then she crosses upstage of so-and-so going between so-and-so and then plays this little thing on the piano and then disappears out through stage right three. You know, like all those little details are the harder ones to notice because the lights are down and, and your eye gets pulled to the next bit part of the story. I started a system with like different colors for every character. Like, you know, I highlighted everything with different colors and then every girl had a different harmony and a choreography that they did. And there were two other swings. We would like in the dressing room before the show, we would run through pretty much, you know, for many days anyway, I don't know if it was every day, but we would say, okay, let's do it now. And you be Venla and you be Elsa and you be Taya. And we would sing through Mama Who Bore Me through those harmonies. And then we would switch it. And I say, okay, now I'm going to be Marta and you're going to be, and we would just do it, you know, run it as, until it was part of our, you know, basically in, in, in the muscle memory. Obviously she did very well for herself, leading to being a swing and fiddler on the roof on Broadway and not to mention the other Broadway show she was later cast in, which we'll talk about later on. Auditioning is always a stressful experience, but for many performers, it can be an opportunity to show the creative team just what they can do, like Canadian actress Kate Etienne did. Originally hailing herself from Newfoundland, Kate Etienne booked an audition for the Toronto production of Come From Away. The audition process at first, it was just Stephanie Warren, in the room. I was called for Janice, went in for that, did my sides, and Stephanie looked at me and was like, you're from there, aren't you? <laughs> I was like, is this a problem? <laughs> so she, she moved me straight to the callbacks, which were about a month afterwards. And David and Irene, the writers of the show, were there. And I finished doing my Janice sides. I sang Welcome to the Rock. Irene kind of leaned over to David. They like whispered a little bit to each other. She said, we really, I want to see you do the Bonnie sides. And I got to go out of the room and, and sit with them for a minute. And I came back in and I did them. And then they gave me a little bit of direction and I did them again. Then again. And they said, can you come back on Thursday? And I said, no. <laughs> I'm flying back to Regina in the morning. Oh, uh, well, we want to hear you sing this song, but and I was like, is it me in the sky? <laughs> and they were like, yeah. So I like, can do that. I'll do it right now. I'm ready to do this. And then I had the sheet music and I walked in, I put the sheet music on the floor and just sang it because I'd been singing it in my bedroom since the original Broadway cast was in Toronto before they went to Broadway. I loved it. I auditioned on the Monday and on the Sunday, my agent called me. And my life changed. Kate was cast in the original Toronto company of Come From Away as a standby. Now, some of you may be asking, but what, pray tell, is a standby? Well, I'm glad you asked, Jesse. A standby, like a swing, comes to the theater every day and only goes on if the performer they're covering is out of the show. In most shows, a standby is dedicated to understudying one specific role. A classic example some may cite is the role of Alphaba in Wicked, that has a designated standby that acts as the first cover should the principal performer be indisposed. If the standby is indisposed, the ensemble member who understudies the role becomes the second cover and, well, you get the idea, right? In the case of a show like Come From Away, where the 12 actors on stage are the principal performers, the show standbys actually learn multiple roles, just as the swings do. I stood by for Janice, the reporter, Bonnie, the SPCA worker, Beverly, the pilot, and Hannah. We were the very first company that they were putting this on. We were the first ones after the Broadway cast. So this was the first time that they were teaching it to somebody else. So I think they were learning as they were, as we were learning. I watched the company, like many a brain go. 
<laughs> whether you were a standby or not. First step was just having the information at my disposal. I had diagrams with the colors that I had highlighted my script with. We went around as standbys and took pictures of all the chairs. I had a file, I still have a file on my phone called CFA chairs. And then I went back. So it would be like, if Janice is on seven, Bonnie's on five. And then as time went on, it would be add that next one. Janice is on seven, Bonnie's on five, Beverly's on three. Okay, all right. Those are all odd numbers. Remember, this is an odd number scene, like a springboard kind of thing. Like if you feel like you're getting lost, I was in such a state of panic during the rehearsal process that I, I was like, I need to know all of this right now because we don't know what could happen at any given time. The beautiful, talented, fabulous Kristen Peace uh, had a stomach bug literally the day before opening and she just couldn't do it. I had kind of a warning the night before being like, she's not feeling great. So just like, you know, and I was like, I have not, we have not done this, put in. <laughs> um, so it was kind of like taking it from 2D to 4D. <laughs> it was all there. I had all the information. I knew all the information, but to do it, like to physicalize it is a, just a different thing. And I messaged Petrina Bromley on Broadway and I said, guess what? Today at 2 p.m. there's going to be two Newfoundlanders playing body. <laughs> and she was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry about that first plane transition. That was my fault. I, I volunteered to do too many things. And she did. You run like a f***ing mad person. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like a mad person. Just around the stage, around the stage, around the stage. Move chairs, move all the chairs. And then there is the more common role of the standby, dedicated to being the primary cover for one specific part. The huge demands of a particular role are often what warrant a designated standby. A role like, say, Fanny Bryce in Funny Girl. I found out about it when I saw the press release that, that Beanie was going to play Fanny. I wrote to my agents and I said, that's such great casting. And if there's, you know, an understudy for her, I'd love to be seen for it. And then, you know, many months went by and I got a self-tape, but I really, I, I really did not think I, I had any shot, you know, any shot. I was like, they're not gonna pick me, but I had a lot of fun. Like I had a different outfit for every, every scene. And my husband is a pianist. He's a jazz pianist. You know, they had sent me like an accompaniment track to sing with, but I was like, honey, like, can you play for me? So he played for me and um, yeah, I had a lot of fun putting the video together, didn't hear. Then like weeks later, so I heard you have a call back. I was like, wow, like that's, I'm not gonna get this. So and I think probably that attitude of like, there's no way this is gonna happen, probably helped me relax in the audition. I mean, and I knew Michael from Spring Awakening, so it was at least nice to walk in and feel like I have a friend there, you know, who knows me. I still didn't hear, you know, for, a, and so I wrote to my agent and I said, oh, I guess that's not happening. And and then he called me and he said, I just got an email, you know? <laughs> and I was like, you're kidding. This is a joke. You're kidding. Are you kidding? This is a joke. Yeah, you know, I just, I couldn't accept it. I really honestly didn't believe that it was real until I got to rehearsal. You know, we all went around the first day, but you know what I said, like, and I'm the fanny standby and everybody started applauding. And I was like, wait, wait this is really happening. I couldn't believe it. For Funny Girl, you know, the days that I had were on the books. So they did try to give me some rehearsal. There wasn't a lot of time, but I did get the chance to run the show on the deck once through with other understudies. And then I did also get to put in on the day of my first performance. You want to do the best job you can because you don't know the next time you'll go on. You just have to be prepared at all times and do, there's so much work that goes into keeping yourself ready, you know, all the time. I do the show on my own many times a week just because it, it requires a lot of stamina, so you have to do all that work on your own. So, since I began conducting these interviews last spring, a lot has happened in the theater world. Julie Benko, of course, is enjoying a month-long run headlining Funny Girl on Broadway, before becoming the alternate in September, where she will be guaranteed at least one show a week. The circumstances around that are complicated, and this is not the video to unpack that here. If anything, part of the online furor surrounding that whole situation only reiterates a peculiar disconnect between members of the audience and their regard for performers. Whether it's their understanding of what it takes to get up on that stage, or just plain f***ing decency.
I think people generally are just surprised at the amount of information we have to, to know and learn. Someone actually replied to my thing on Instagram saying, like, I have learned nine times as much information on this show as one of the boys in the ensemble in the same amount of time. We, we all get the same 12 week rehearsal period. And actually, you could argue that we get less because I'm not physically doing it every day. A lot of the time, swings are stood at the side at the back trying to stay out of the way because we don't want to be in the way and and very much the rehearsal process is for the ensemble and the principals because they're learning it too i don't want to be getting in the way and while they're still trying to get it in their bodies and understand what it is for themselves people that go to shows it's quite a thing over here if the star of the show gets announced that they're not on it's the cover there's lots of like disappointment and tweeting like so disappointed that blah 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 wasn't in the show it's wild and people don't think about how that can like affect someone's Especially people that are in like big roles, I think that a lot of them have hard, hard time like um, with fans and, and things like that, so yeah. When people open their programs and see that insert, I think oftentimes there's this preconceived notion for a lot of theater goers out there that they're seeing a lesser performance because the person is not on that day. And there could be nothing farther from the truth. You could even be seeing a better show than what you would have seen had the whole cast been on because everybody's firing on different cylinders because there's that whole yes and thing happening because people are having to react to a new human on stage, a new physical form, a new delivery. I think when people go to see shows and they see that there's an understudy on or standby on, they should go. Um, they should go, oh, I'm so excited because I get to see this moment that people are pouring all of their their energy into to make really special you know that I think it, people should go they should be excited because you know that that understudy has been just working for months or whatever or years for this you know specific role but for their whole life <laughs> to to prepare for this moment Returning to live performances in the middle of a global pandemic is incredibly challenging. This on top of navigating an already turbulent industry that is sometimes prone to resounding noise. To finish this episode off on a personal and positive note, thanks to my conversations with Tommy, Kate, and Julie, I have to say that I particularly enjoyed my recent visits to the theater, which included Moulin Rouge in London's West End, where four covers were on in principal parts, and just recently in Toronto, seeing the pre-Broadway run of Anne Juliet, where the bulk of the principal cast at my performance were played by understudies. First, I had so much fun at both shows, but my appreciation for the covers, all of whom were incredible by the way, was even greater than before. Were it not for the little piece of paper that fell out of my program, I would have had no idea there were understudies in my show. Riffing off of something that Tommy said earlier in this episode, it takes incredibly hard work to make it all look seamless. In the midst of the aforementioned resounding noise, I think it's all the more important to recognize, celebrate, and hold up the incredible talents who have put in the work to ensure that the show does indeed go on. So the next time you find that insert in your program, yeah, be excited. You just never know. Thank you for watching this episode. Who are some of your favorite understudies? If you have any stories you'd like to share, leave them in the comments. As always, if you like this content and want to see more, make sure to like this video and hit that subscribe button. Till next time, stay tuned.